conclusion of the whole matter. These are the words of the preacher. It's the concluding words of the preacher. It is the last chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes written by the preacher. And his statement is this, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Any writer, any play writer will tell you, or any book writer will tell you, that the most important phase of the book, part of the drama, is the last scene or the last chapter. All the scenes point to the last. All of the chapters of the book point toward the concluding chapter. Any lawyer will tell you that in the courtroom, the final arguments are the most valuable part of the trial. Therefore, the lawyer tries his very best to bring every impressive point out that he can. He dismisses any shallow thinking and he combines it all and tries to put it all in those concluding statements. I've listened to them in their argument, and they bring every bit of the uh, ability they have to the forefront to try to impress that jury because the last statements are being made. This is the concluding statement. And when it comes to religion, when it comes to God, the sad thing that I've found in the world that I live in is the greater portion of religion has never offered men the concluding chapter. They only offer you the first few chapters of religion and say, now you've got to take the rest of the faith. But the preacher said, let us hear the conclusion of the matter. Hallelujah. The conclusion. I would like to turn to First Peter and read to you the first chapter. I would like for this audience to understand that there is something that is being kept secret that is not being explained. They have not carried you farther enough. Let us hear the conclusion of the matter. First chapter of First Peter reads like this. Whom having not seen, we love. In whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Peter is simply making this statement clear. The prophets foresaw the sufferings of our Lord. Isaiah was careful to describe the one that he saw, that he looked like one coming from Edom with dyed garments from Bortha, whose garments were stained. And he asked the question, Who is it? The answer came back, It is I, mighty to save. Why is your garment so stained? The answer, prophetic answer was this, I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me. That was the prophetic statement and vision of the sufferings of our Lord. As they also recorded the fact that he saw one growing up, as a root out of a dry ground. He saw him, he had no common, no beauty, nothing that we should desire, Isaiah said. But he described him as being a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He suffered, he was bruised, he was chastised, Isaiah foresaw. Many of the prophets foretold of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. And the pathetic thing about it is, the suffering of Jesus was for a reason, for a specific purpose, and the world has forgotten that purpose and that reason. The world would have you stop, the religious world would have you stop at Calvary. I was in South America and we went up on the hill, the hill of the bleeding Christ where the temple is, and I watched those poor helpless souls 
And their vision of God and the program of God is the gloomy, dark shadows of death. As they crawl on their hands and knees, 1,000 feet up, their hands and knees are bleeding. They think this is the part that I need to do that I might be saved. And as they stop before the different phases of the sufferings of Jesus, first he is up there being cried, then the image of him of their own cross, and then the tomb. And it stops right there. They never show them anything but the gloomy, sad picture of the beatings and the suffering and the tomb and the cross. And the religious world stops you right there and leaves you suspended, thinking nothing of but the sad, gloomy, depressed, lonely Calvary. That's all. They, uh, they pick their songs, and I love the story of Calvary. There's not a man living that enjoys listening to the songs and the sermons about Calvary anymore than I do. I love the old rugged cross. I love to sing it. But, friend, it is unfair to you that I should stop you at the story of Calvary. For God did not intend for you to only hear the bleeding and the sob dripping of blood. He wanted you to know more than the dying of our Lord. He wanted you to understand there's more to this than a tomb and a cross and a robe and blood and a whip and a sword. He wants you to see that there's more to it than that. And the trouble is that you have not heard that there is a conclusion to the matter. And I'm going to do my best to show you the concluding part of this story. I'm going to read more than the first chapter. I'm going to read more than the third one. I'm going to read the last one. And that's what's most valuable to us tonight. The word of the Lord teaches so clearly that they testified of his sufferings beforehand. But that's not all that they testified of. They also testified of the glory that should follow. Hallelujah. When after Calvary, he rose. He walked for 40 days on the earth. Testified and witness to those disciples and then ascended on high. And after about seven days, here comes Calvary's effect. Here comes the result of the cross of Jesus Christ. The second chapter of Acts, Brother Lawrence, would you get it and read it for us? And let's just see what the concluding chapter is. It didn't stop at Calvary. The tomb did not stop this religion. It did not stop at the dark overshadowing of clouds at Calvary. No, no, no. There is something that follows that. And that's what we've been trying to tell you about tonight. It's the glory that should follow. Second chapter of Acts, we find a group in an upper room. And they're praising and blessing God. And what does it say? And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, all right, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Oh, hallelujah to God. This is after Calvary. This is after the suffering. This is after the tomb. The prophet said there's going to come something following the sufferings of Jesus Christ. But it was for that reason that he suffered, that you and I could have an experience of power with God. For a long time, man had sought an answer to the sin problem. They could not overcome their sins and their weaknesses. They cried. They offered their bullets. They offered their lambs. Once a year did they go with their fair sacrifices to try to appease God for the sin that they had committed. But nowhere could you find a remedy for sin. Nowhere was there found an answer to the sin problem. But Jesus Christ came once and for all, offering himself as a sacrifice. And after this suffering, that was to come a mighty experience. And now we find in the upper room about 120 folks. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is there. And all of a sudden, here comes as a rushing mighty wind from heaven. The glory of God settled down in that room. Everything up there began to speak in a heavenly language as the Spirit gave the utterance. Friend, here is the glory that should be revealed. Here is that concluding chapter. 
Here is the effects of the sufferings of Calvary. Even Isaiah himself, he didn't stop at the foretelling and prophesying of the sufferings. He also foretold the glory that should come. Read in the 28th chapter of Isaiah. Thank God, it's there. Right. That prophet foresaw what Calvary was going to purchase, what it was going to produce in the lives of individuals. And he foresaw it and prophesied of it. He said, to whom shall we teach now? Whom shall we make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little and there a little. That simply means this. You cannot take one scripture and make a doctrine out of it. It must be precept upon precept. Line upon line. Comparing one with another. And nowhere in this Bible does one scripture contradict another. It is line upon line. Line parallel with line. Precept parallel with precept. Thank God one answers the other. One opens up the other. One may be obscure, but read the other one, and it will make it clear and understandable. Oh, line upon line, precepts upon precepts, here a little and there a little. Now listen to his prophecy of what should follow. Look what he said. For with stammering lips, the whole world spends multiplied millions of dollars trying to bring God into a painted room, some sort of an image, some sort of a choir, some sort of a musical instrument, some sort of a dogma, some social doctrine, trying to bring God in, trying to find him in college, trying to find him in the seminary, searching all over the place, how can I get God? And everybody winds up saying we need God, we got to have God, we don't have God. And I heard some of the religious leaders of the land say that even though church membership is rising, Christianity is falling. Sins are multiplying, increasing. Somebody makes a decision for Christ and keeps on cussing and keeps on drinking and keeps on chewing. And it doesn't change his life. And what's the answer? So they go a little deeper in theology and they go a little deeper in the seminary. And they wind up with some foreign Greek and try to interpret this and interpret that. But it's so simple. The prophet said, thank God for this. And it's simple. It's wonderful. Listen to it. With stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. What? What? Listen to it again. Read it, Brother Lord, just in case they think I might be quoting out of the Frizzle book at all. How with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to the people? Who knows? How with stammering lips and another tongue, stammering, stammering, stammering. Pardon me, but it says stammering, stammering lips. And the reason I'm repeating that is the fellow at the seminary read that and he didn't even catch that stammering lips. Hallelujah. And there's thirst for peace, rest, refreshment. Oh, this is how bad I've done. I went into that place and there was such a peace in the meat. The lights were just right and the candles were glowing and everything was playing happily. Oh, please hear the concluding story. Thank God. Would you let me read you the last chapter? Thank God. Calvary is not all there is to this, and I thank God that, that it's not. I'd hate to know my religion was built strictly and solely on a dark, gloomy picture of Calvary. Friend, there's more to it. There was a resurrection. There was an ascension. And then there was the return of the baptism of the Holy Ghost into the hearts of the individuals in the upper room. And the thing about it is this. Peter stood up after they got through talking in tongues and falling out and kicking and shouting and walling all over the place. 
And don't tell me they didn't do it. The Bible says those standing by said these men are drunk. You know what I've heard some folks say about that upper room? They said uh, 120 folks was gathered up there and they were all sitting there and then all of a sudden they all said, Praise the Lord! And that was the noise that was heard. Mm. Now, can you imagine a drunk? Now, get this in your mind, a drunk. <coughs> Do you picture a drunk? I mean drunk. Isn't that real crazy? Tired, crazy. Somehow, none of that does That's not what I think of when I think of a drunk. When I think of someone drunk, I just, I usually picture someone uh, uh, who walks through, you know, and uh, barely stand up. And when they talk, it don't sound like they know what they're doing. <laughs> Now that's my image, that's the image comes to me of someone drunk. Uh, I guess it's generally, it's because I generally, the drunk I've seen, that's the way they act. Now then, what I can't figure out is how a religious world looks on the upper room and says that bunch was not cutting up like these Pentecostals cut up. When the one present declared every one of them drunk. Now, you picture the rest in your mind, 120 drunks in one room. Now, wait a minute. You didn't get that. 120 drunks in one room. Do you think there's going to be some noise in there? Who's the detectives in the city of mine was telling me about they carrying a drunk in one night? The old boy, and he kept saying, I've got some heart. That officer said, do you holler in our speaker if it's too good? Who said, yes, but officer, I've got some fun. I can't stand it no longer. I've got some fun. <laughs> he just said, do you realize this is people here and houses here? And we and he said, but officer, you, you're just going to have to get me where I can hide. And he said, I don't know. I, I don't know what it is about that stuff. It makes them want to have I've always thought maybe it was just, you know, put on the suit. But uh, my little sister, my sister uh, got a hold of some uh, blackberry juice that had uh, uh, been opened and we didn't know anything about it and it, it had some in it. And she got a hold of it and when she uh, sat out in the floor, and she's a very quiet nature girl. But she sat down in that floor and started teaching to the school. <laughs> and she uh, talked about things. And my mother thought she was going crazy and black-scared of the devil. She had a cousin and she said, I'm going to kill old Phil. She says, I see that hammer hanging in that tree. She said, I'm going to get that hammer and I'm going to kill him. And then she had who? Just who? Well, come to find out, she's drunk. They got into the cabinet and got some firmly black beer juice and they just really. Well, what I'm saying is this. The, the folks standing by, <coughs> close by that upper room, <coughs> looked in there and saw folks so acting that they discerned or thought they discerned that the whole bunch was drunk. Now tell me what were they doing? All sitting up straight, quiet, hands folded, bridge bowed. All of them had them a set of beads coming through there. Right. Well, I just can't imagine. I would not detect folks being drunk. I would just say, I'm not My vision of the upper room is this. I see Mary, the mother of Jesus, sprawled out on the floor, kicking his feet. 
I see Matthew just, oh, he just, he just, he just, he just, he just, yeah, yeah. And there's no telling what Peter was doing. See, he was emotional anyhow. He cut a fellow's ear off and he was always doing something, you know. There's no way of knowing what that old boy was doing about that. I would have every reason to believe in the world that he was wise. A hundred and twenty drunks, put a hundred and twenty drunks in this building and watch the action and listen to the noise. Friends, what happened in that upper room was simply this. The power that Calvary purchased was administered and given to that kind of God. All of a sudden, their heart received the mighty dynamite of this Holy Ghost. Oh, Jesus said in the first chapter of the book of Acts, the eighth verse, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come on you. That word power is translated, it actually means dynamite. You shall receive dynamite. Oh, my God. Can you imagine a big stick of dynamite putting up? Well, I'm never moving. Wow. Right. 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 They'd like for you to believe that God would want you to stop and look at Calvary and Calvary, Calvary only. But friend, there's another chapter. There's an experience that Calvary purchased for every one of us. Peter stood up with the eleven after they finally got sobered up enough to even get quiet. <laughs> they were so noisy until the multitude came around to see what in the world. Some mocked, some stood off and stopped, some wondered, some were puzzled. Others said they're drunk. And when they finally got sober enough in the spirit, they finally sobered up enough. And Peter finally got them quiet enough. He stands up and declares, These men are not drunk, as you suppose. Seeing it's but the third hour of the day. But this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And he says, boys, this is what the prophet said would come. This is the glory they prophesied should buy. This is what Isaiah said was coming. Stammering lips and another tongue. See if they did what Isaiah said they'd do. Brother Lawrence has just read it to you. They spoke with stammering lips. They spoke with a cloven tongue, which means split or unknown. And they also spoke in other tongues. Two types of tongues were spoken in on the day of Pentecost. There was the cloven split tongue, which was unknown to everything present. And there was the other tongue, which was the miraculous moving of the Holy Ghost to allow them to speak in the languages present. And that happens often. I was talking in tongues one night, and God knows I don't know nothing about Spanish. A Spanish man came up to me, or at least a man who understood it, said, Brother Bean, can you speak Spanish? I said, no. He said, well, you talked to me tonight. I said, well, I'm sorry. I didn't understand a word of it. And he told me what I had said. Miraculously, the Lord allowed me to speak in that. But it doesn't have to be a language prayer. Paul said in Corinthians, they that speak in an unknown tongue, Speaketh not unto man, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Now be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Oh, the concluding chapter is, you can have the Holy Ghost. Peter stood up and said, boys, listen to me. Every one of you listen. Give ear to me. Jesus Christ was crucified. You crucified and you nailed him to the cross. But he has been made both Lord and Christ. And I'd have you know, if you'll repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, you also shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. For the promise is unto you, your children, all that are afar off. Why, would not a religious leader want you to know that? Huh? 
I wonder, son. I don't understand. Why would I want to deprive anyone of such a marvelous experience? You see, they'll take you over there where Paul was in prison. Now, what's this? But how unfair it is. Then Paul was in prison, and of course the earthquake came and delivered him out. And the jailer was standing there. Had been given the charge to keep Paul in prison, and if he let him out, it was his life for Paul. Now, he was under an oath. He was sworn to protect and guard that man. If he let him loose, it meant he was to be killed. Now, knowing the danger that he was in, all of a sudden the jail doors are open. <coughs> His prisoner to walk on out. The Bible says he starts to kill himself. Commit suicide. Now, a religious world would have you believe in what they read. Paul screams out, says, Do thyself no harm. The man fell at Paul's feet, or at least cried out and said, Men, what must I do to be saved? Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Stop. Close the book. Don't read any further. And the religious world has cheated you. That's not all of that story. Amen. Oh, let's make a doctrine out of that. That sounds easy. That's what the flesh and the devil want. See, they want, see the flesh don't want to get into this thing. The flesh is against God. It's an enemy of God. And that's why that old unruly member, the most unruly member of your body is the tongue. That's why you don't want to talk in tongues. That old unruly member don't want to die. Boy, I had a lady come up to me bragging on me one night. I thought, man, I'm really doing good. She said, Brother Bean, I've enjoyed your sermon so much, with one exception, that I'm stumbling over this point of tongue. Oh. Somebody hadn't read it. Hallelujah. Let's make a religion out of it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I shall be saved. They don't even quote the rest of the verse. It said, and I have. Which simply means if you're going to take it literally as it is written, this man could believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and save his whole house by his belief. And they wouldn't need his prayer. Read it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they weren't even prayer. There's got to be a conclusion to that. Hallelujah. Let's Amen. find what that conclusion was. I'll tell you what it was. Paul went home with the old boy and preached to him. Right. And somewhere about 12 o'clock or a little after, we have a bit of fresh baptism so essential and so important until he took that jailer out and baptized him and his whole house. And I'll tell you how he baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus. The reason I know that is Paul said the things I teach you Corinthians, I teach in all churches. And in the 19th chapter of the book of Acts, Paul personally baptized twelve folks in the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, the conclusion of that story is they didn't just believe in the theory or the historical fact of Jesus Christ. There was a deeper believing than what met the eye. The believing that boy had to save him was the believing that took him to him was the believing that took him to the watery grave. The believing that got him the baptism of the Holy Ghost. For the 16th chapter of the book of St. Mark, Jesus plainly said, These signs shall follow them that believe. I've read to you out of 1 Peter where it said, Receiving the end of your faith. I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but wait a minute, I'm going to get some results from that faith. There's going to be a conclusion of that faith. There's going to be an ending chapter of that faith. Receiving the end of your faith. I believe, so I receive the end of my faith. What is the end of my faith? Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they'll cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. That's the end of my faith. There comes the results of my family. 
You just said that you believe on me as the scripture has said. Not historical facts, not just the fact that he lived and died and rose again, but believe as the scripture said, and the scripture said, with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. For whom he said, This is the rest for which you may call the weary. And this is the refreshing. Do you know the meaning of the word refreshing? Then if you want it, you can have it with an old fashioned tongue talking experience. And what is so bad about me letting God use my tongue to speak of his language? After all, I praise him with all the vocabulary I've got and still feel like I haven't praised him. I need some kind of a language to praise him in, so why not borrow the heavenly? Why not borrow the language of angels? Why not talk in the, the language of immortal? So God allowing this little mortal right here, not knowing how to praise his God sufficient, there's not a one of us that knows. Study the rest of your life. Memorize Winston, the Webster's, or whoever fiction, and you still don't know enough to praise God. So God says, All right, old boy, I'm going to give you a tongue to praise me in. And that's going to be a heavenly language. Thank God, Paul said, How be it in the Spirit, He speaketh mystery. <laughs> it simply means this. See, you never know nowadays. You can be talking on the phone. Somebody may be tapping your line. <coughs> Have you read about that here lately? What a growing fad that is. Let's just get a picture out of talking to my wife. We never know. But to see God's just picture where you and I can have a private, direct line. Mm -hmm. Nobody mm -hmm. understands it, not even the devil. Mm -hmm. You can remember that. Mm -hmm. When I'm talking in tongues, the devil himself don't even know what I'm saying. It's a secret between my soul and my God. I'm speaking mysteries in the spirit. If every dialect, every language in the world was present, not one of them would understand me. That's what Paul said. And of course, it is so true. Let's read it. Let's be sure we're not misquoting the scripture. 14th chapter, 1 Corinthians. Listen to the word. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, speaketh, not unto men. Oh, somebody says that other tongue or that and Jesus is talking about these signs shall follow them that believe they shall speak with new tongues. And I've heard it explained like this. That means they quit cussing. They've got a cleaner tongue now. This says, speak of not unto men. Oh, Paul says, I'd rather... Uh, speaking five words in a known language and 10,000 in an unknown, but he said, I speak in tongues more than you all. Now, the reason Paul said that was that he knew more languages than they did. He had been to school. Listen, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, this is the same Paul to him to talk to him. Speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. No man understandeth him. No man understandeth him. I want to repeat that because folks that have you believe, a preacher in South Louisiana was on the radio one day and he said, Folks, oh, listen carefully now, I'm fixing to introduce my evangelist. He's fixing to talk in tongues. And he came on speaking French. Well, how to say Paul says, no man understandeth him. No man understandeth him. If there was a Frenchman there, he wouldn't understand it. If there was a German there, he wouldn't understand it. If there was an Italian there, he wouldn't understand it. Oh, hallelujah to God. If there was a Spanish there, he wouldn't know a thing that was being said. Yes, sir. Glory to God. I like that. Direct line between my soul and heaven. Glory to God forever. And that's what Isaiah foretold would follow the sufferings of Jesus Christ. In the upper room, some close to 50 days after the crucifixion, after the suffering, some 50 days later, the thing the prophet said would follow his sufferings 
the glory that should follow did come. And they speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them a truth. Friend, don't stop with the, the word of... In the first place, when Paul was talking to that jailer, he didn't have time to explain all of it. The man fixed him to kill his head. Now, man, if I see somebody think cut his throat, I wouldn't have time to explain Acts 238 story. I'd try to get the knife away from him first. Paul wasn't explaining all that was to be explained by saying that. To prove it, he went home with him and spent up till midnight and later explaining what he was talking about when he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. How's his house going to be saved? By believing also. What is the result of the belief? The effect will be they shall speak with new tongues. Right. Hallelujah. The conclusion of the matter. Lord God, I'm glad there's another chapter. If it wasn't, we'd be in the biggest mess. Some folks would have you believe the stop was John the Baptist. He preached repentance and baptism. And they say, that's all. But friend, that doesn't conclude that story. <laughs> John himself declared and pointed to another part of the play. He said, I must decrease, but he must increase. I'm not worthy to unloose his shoes. But I'm telling you, I've only baptized you under repentance, saying, believe on him that should come. And he said, when he will come, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. John himself pointed to the concluding chapter. He said, boys, 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 listen, men, men, listen to me. Don't stop here with me. My message is not all there is. He said, I must decrease. This is not all of it, boys. Read the last chapter. Listen, I'm telling you there's a last chapter. John said, boys, Listen, I'm only preparing the way for it. Please believe me that when he comes, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. There's going to be a concluding chapter to it. Thank God. And that same bus following John after Jesus came on the scene, started following Jesus, and some of that same bus was up in that upper room and got that Holy Ghost John sent that yes. Don't stop with John the Baptist baptizing, folks. Lord, no. In fact, John's message, even his message, decreased and declined and faded away. So much so that in the 19th chapter of Acts, look at it real carefully, and of course we're going to close here in a minute. I tell you, I just feel like I want everybody to know about this. There's a last chapter to all of it. Seeing to pass while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. These were church members. They belonged to a church. They were followers of John. They are, were definitely died in the world Baptists. Now don't be offended at that because they were. After all, there ought to be a place somewhere in here for the Baptists. And so here they are. Seven. And he said unto them, you see, Paul loved them just like we do. I think they're some of the greatest people in the world. He said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Or in other words, have they read the last chapter to you? Or did they just read the first one that said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Did they read the last chapter where it said you'd get something for that believing? Paul said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Somebody says, as much as gone Holy Ghost crazy. You ought to look in the book of Acts and see if we've gone Holy Ghost crazy. You can't hardly read a chapter in the book of Acts that they have not mentioned somebody getting the Holy Ghost, received the Holy Ghost. And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Nobody read us the conclusion. Well, Paul said, I'm fixing to tell it to you. And he said unto them, unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. John so decreased that his baptism was of none effect at this point. He faded away. His disciples had to be rebaptized. Their baptism was not sufficient. Simply meaning this. You see, John spanned a little tide in there. He was a forerunner of preparation for the coming of Jesus. But after Jesus suffered and died and rose again and ascended on high, there was a brand new dispensation brought into effect. The thief on the cross was not in the dispensation that you and I live in at all. For Jesus was not yet dead. He had not been buried. He had not ascended on high. 
That's why he didn't have to have the Holy Ghost. That's why he didn't have to be baptized in Jesus' name. He lived beyond the dispensation, on the other side of the dispensation, that you and I live in. But when Jesus ascended on high, it broke open a brand new dispensation. Right. And if I had the time, I'd go in the book of Revelation and prove to you that the dispensation that you and I live in was the most worthy, inquired about, studied, hungered for, in any dispensation known. All the prophets looked ahead for this. Every one of them. In the fifth chapter of the book of Revelation, John said, I saw a book sealed, the seven seals. And he heard a voice, and he said, nobody was worthy to open. There's such for somebody in heaven, somebody on the earth, somebody under the earth. And there wasn't anyone found worthy to open the book. And he said, I saw one slain as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Walk up and take the book out of his hand and open it and break the seal. Do you know what that book represents? And that seal? Those seals represented the dispensation in which you and I live. And the only thing that could break it was the blood of the spotless Son of God. That dispensation was opened on the day of Pentecost when this great experience that was to follow Calvary did come. And now you and I are still in it. We have not changed dispensation. Thank God the Holy Ghost is still in the earth. Hallelujah. A beautiful type of man, and I, I'm just getting so excited tonight. I hope I'm not just going too fast. But a beautiful type of that is found in the Old Testament. You see, the Old Testament is altogether types and shadows of the New Testament. For they fought literal battles, that was a type of us fighting spiritual battles. It is a type, an allegory. It is a forerunner. It's a schoolmaster to bring us to this. What you read in the Old Testament, you read it in the light of it being a type, a shadow, an allegory. When Noah was, had built his ark, and it was afloat, time came the rain ceased. First of all, he sent out a raven. That raven never returned, but he sent his dove out. And after a while, here comes the dove back. It brings it back into the ark. Amen? It sends it out again. <laughs> it goes out this time and comes back with an olive branch plucked off and brings it back to Noah. Which meant the waters were not abated. They were, had not gone down enough. The third time he sends the dove out, the Bible said the dove never returns. Praise God. Now, what is the type in it? The dove is the type of the Holy Ghost. Find that in the New Testament, the dove descended over Jesus Christ. In the form of a dove, the Holy Ghost appeared. It's a type of the Holy Ghost. God sent his Spirit out into the world. The world was full of sin. He sent his Spirit through the different dispensations, the conscience age, the law, all of that. But you see, it never worked. The law never worked. The Bible said it didn't. So he sent his spirit out and overshadowed a virgin. And the Old Testament declares Jesus Christ as being an olive branch. And that dove brought back the olive branch into the ark. When the Spirit of God overshadowed the virgin, she conceived and bore a son. They called his name Jesus. That was the olive branch. And after 33 years and a half, the Spirit lifted him up and brought him into the ark. Now what happens? They wait a while. Seven days in every case they wait. Seven days in the upper room they tarry. The olive branch has been brought in. Jesus Christ has ascended on high. Seven days of waiting. The dove is sent out again and it never returned this time. What does that mean? The day of Pentecost came. The Spirit was sent out into the world in the form of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Speaking in other tongues. Friend, that dove has never gone back. It's still in the earth. The Baptists are getting it. In San Antonio, Texas, Brother King was in a meeting with some preachers, Episcopal bishop, a first uh, Christian, a Church of Christ, a Baptist, and I don't know how many others. Those men became very anxious, asking questions about the Holy Ghost. They were eating, and finally the Episcopal bishop 
shoved his plate back and said, Reverend King, do you suppose that God would give me the Holy Ghost? <laughs> he said, why, well, certainly he'll give it to me. He said, can I have it right now? He said, you certainly can. And the owner of the restaurant happened to be a member of the Episcopal Bishop's Church. He said, men, there's a little room in upstairs that you fellows are welcome to use if you want to go pray. So they filed into an upper room. And Brother King laid his hands on that old bishop's head. And he began to talk in tongues. His head began to shake. His tongue came out. He began to rattle a language that he'd never spoken in before in his life. He had never learned it in school. What does it mean? The dove has been sent out and has never returned. The Holy Ghost is still in the land. It's still for every man. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, it's for you, your children, all that are afar off. Thank God some folks would have you believe it was just for the twelve apostles, and then it was thrown back into the ark. Not so. The dove is still in the earth today. Oh, it's still in the earth today. I got it right now, and I'm about to have a fit over it. Well, let's go on here. These Baptist folks had been baptized by John, and it had been outdated. It was, uh, you know, obsolete. And Peter, uh, Paul rather says, fellas, have you ever got the Holy Ghost? If you meet up with one of these apostolics, the first thing they want to know is not what church you belong to, but did you get the Holy Ghost? <laughs> you see, we know we read that last chapter. We know there's an experience called the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They said, no, we were baptized under John's baptism. He said, well, my, don't you understand that John foretold that she was going to get the Holy Ghost? Read it and see if John didn't say it. He said, he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost. What's the matter with you fellas? Didn't you ever go get it? Well, no, sir, we didn't read the last chapter. Nobody told us that it had fallen. We didn't know anything about it. So Paul began to explain it, and when they heard this, they were baptized over again in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Isaiah said they'll speak with stammering lips and another tongue. Jesus said, these signs will follow them that believe. They'll speak with new tongues. The conclusion of your faith, if you really believe, as the Scripture says, will bring you to the same experience. In closing tonight, let me read in the 18th chapter, and then I've got the point. Look at this in the 24th verse. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man. Now listen to this, please. An eloquent man. And mighty in the scriptures, we could call him a Billy Graham, eloquent. And mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in the spirit, compliments if you didn't understand it. To say a man's eloquence is a compliment. To say he's fervent in the spirit is a compliment. To say he's instructed in the way of the Lord and mighty in the scriptures, that's a compliment. He spake and taught diligently. That's a compliment. That's better than some will do. The things of the Lord. But listen, knowing only the baptism of John, who never had read the last chapter. Isn't that good? And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them, the way of God more perfectly. And if you want to know about it, this was one of them got the Holy Ghost. Preaching, knows a lot about the Bible, but he didn't know anything but the baptism of John. Nobody had ever read to him the last chapter where it said they got the Holy Ghost. So here comes a couple along and says, Look, come here, sir. We feel like you're used to the Come over here. Come and tell us. Now, we've got a good teacher. We're doing a good job. And you're keeping folks out of sight. And you're probably teaching some good morals. But let me tell you, that's not all there is to this thing. Come over here.
we'll tell you about it. Oh, and you know oh, what they God. told him? They told him he could have the Holy Ghost talking in the world. This is story of the world. Oh, God. But I say I was going to quit. Forgive me for that. I got one more, and I remember. For tenth chapter of Acts, I just seem like God to get old brother Camille in this thing before I finish it up. Brother Lawrence, get it from me if you don't mind, and let's read about that good Christian man so called in our today. You know, calendar, he would be called a good There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, all right? a centurion of a band called the Italian band, mm -hmm. a devout man, okay. and one that feared God with all his house, mm -hmm. which gave much alms to the people, good giver. and prayed to God always. Hey. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? Do you know those folks? Excuse me a minute, but those folks that don't see an angel, they stop right there, and you couldn't get them no further. They say, If I'm that close to God to see an angel, don't tell me I need any more religion. Uh -huh. No one any more angels is here enough to do. If anybody stops their brother, I got it. Well, just because an angel shows up, don't mean you got salvation. This angel came to tell him what to do, where to go and get it. Spend him this time. I go over there after Simon was called for. And he was in Cornelius' household, and he's reading the concluding chapter. While Peter yet spake these words, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. They of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. How they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Isn't that true? Hallelujah. Pray for a man to bow and fear God and pray and gave on and still was lost. Right. The Bible says he was lost. I didn't say it, the Bible Amen. said. Peter in the 11th chapter is rehearsing the same story to the Jews in Jerusalem. And he said, the angel sent for me, told him to send for me, and I'd tell him words, whereby he and his house would be saved. Which means he was lost. Because he had never read the concluding chapter. When Peter read the concluding chapter, he so easily in this received it so readily that while Peter was talking about it, he said, that's it, that's it, that's it, and started talking in tongues. Hallelujah. Never did get to finish the stone. I'm as certain as I know my name that Peter would have mentioned in that sermon, if it had been left alone, he would have mentioned that did in Jesus' name. Because as soon as to me he got to talking in tongues and they settled down, Peter said, I command him to be baptized. I am the Lord. Holy. 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 Push him away from him, get him off the bridge, yeah. take him home, leave him to the Jews. That's what Paul oh, did. Hallelujah. As a result, he baptized him. Oh, As a result, he got oh, the Holy Ghost. There's something that was a follow calendar. Hallelujah. And that's something I got tonight. The dove of peace has been sent out into a troubled world. But see, the waters were not abated until the third time the dove was sent out. Sin was not handled until the Holy Ghost fell in the upper room. Thank God, thank God. There was nothing to be done with sin. Nobody could quit it. But after the Holy Ghost came, the Bible said, they that are born of God cannot sin. So his seed remains in. The seed of sin, the desire of sin is taken out. Okay. My Lord, you couldn't hire me tonight. 
under any condition. You couldn't earn it. No. Pay me. Entice me in any manner. What would I want with a chew of tobacco? Good. Gracious. All that junk are running down your chin and are swallowing it. And what would I want with a nip of snack? If you could talk in tongues and dip it, you might get choked in it. I'd be scared I'd get choked in it. I was in a, uh, getting a suit down here while back in Houston and that little sign boy put his cigarette right down there between my legs and just let that smoke just sort of hammer up, you know. And that's the worst smelling stuff. I'd rather get buckets. Mm. I said, son, I'll give you an extra dime if you put that thing on. Mm. Well, I went with all that. Lord, mercy, I was on a plane coming from South America and from Panama to New Orleans. It was about a seven-hour flight, non-stop. And here we are in the air, the plane. Thing on there looked like with Brother Cole and myself had a weed. The fog was heavy. I was smoking, I just wasn't holding it in my hand. I was doing a lot of smoking. Oh, I breathed it deep. I turned to Brother Cole, I said, If I had me some green pine straw, I'd start me a smoke right <laughs> Or some of that other stuff we used to use to start smoke with. If I had me some of that, I'd start me a smoke. Throw it a God in the house. Well, wouldn't I have a right yeah. to burn incense as much as they got a right to burn incense? Burn nonsense or whatever it is. <laughs> Killing them with cancer. We preached that for years and they thought we was a bunch of fanatics. Now then they're required to put on that. It's a danger. Yes, sir, and we've been telling them all the time, it'll kill you. It'll destroy you. Right. Come get the Holy Ghost and you won't want them. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, Lord God. have mercy. Hallelujah. I baptized an old boy in Houston one night and his fingers was yellow. All over stained with that stuff. When he came out of the water, God performed such a miracle on him. He looked at his hands and they're as clean as mine right now. He said, not only did he take the desire, but the stains off of my hands. Hey, oh, God. that's a conclusion to this story. Hey. 